Welcome to Hard Talk from Jerusalem. I'm Stephen Sacker. This ancient city has arguably stirred up more passion, argument and hostility than any other. Israel claims it as its undivided capital, a claim which runs counter to international law and much world opinion. But it has been boosted by the decision of Donald Trump to move the U.S. Embassy here. Well, my guest today is Jerusalem's mayor, Nir Barkat. Can Israel conclusively win the struggle for Jerusalem? Mayor Nir Barkat. Welcome to Hard Talk. Welcome to Jerusalem, Steve. Thank you. You're coming to the end of your second term. You've declared there will be no third term, so it's a time to look back in a way. What do you think you have achieved in your pretty much a decade in charge of Jerusalem? Well, I was fortunate to lead Jerusalem in the last decade. Uh, Jerusalem uh, is now in a very positive momentum. Uh, tourism is up. Our high-tech sector, we're one of the top 25 cities in the world. We were never counted as a high-tech city. The city is quiet, one of the safest cities in the world. So I believe I'm leaving the city in a very positive momentum. I received it. It wasn't that positive, to say the least. So I believe that in every practical parameter you check out, is the city doing well? It's common practice that the city is doing very well. Well, that, that is, I may say, a very positive spin. But this city is also one of the most divided in the world. And if one looks at it from the point of view of its Arab citizens, it is a city which has consistently failed its people. Well, I totally disagree with you. The reality is that if you look at our Arab population in Jerusalem, they're doing far better than anywhere in the region, than Syria, than uh, Judah and Samaria, than Gaza. The Arab residents of Jerusalem are part of the city. They have the same quality of, edu of, of uh, uh, health services. They're part of the job and the economy. Their education system is doing much better. So in any practical parameter, the Arab residents of Jerusalem are doing far, far better than they did in the past and far better than any other uh, a, a, a Arab in the, resident, in the area. But this is a, a two-tier city, isn't it, where Arabs are second-class citizens, because you talk about all of the achievements of your 10 years, and, I mean, you've got a tech sector like never before. You're building a financial center. You've got your new trams. You've got massive new hotels. There's a lot to see in Jerusalem that is new that's come under your watch, but very, very little of that has filtered through to prosperity for your Arab citizens. If you look at the Jerusalem Institute for Policy Research now, Numbers, they show that the poverty rate for Arab citizens, residents of your city, has actually gone up during your term. Well, first of all, they're part of the economy, and when it rains, it rains on everyone. The number of people... But according uh, to you, it's not raining for, for Jerusalem, but it is raining for them. That's not true. The reality is that the number of Arabs joining the labor force has dramatically climbed. Uh, you see more and more of the Arab population becoming part of the economy. In the past... They didn't even try to apply for a job. Our unemployment for all sectors is less than 4%, uh, meaning that everyone that wants a job can and gets a job. The next point is that the quality um, of life vis-a-vis, um, -vis, um, if you look at the services they get in the hospitals and everything, they're like everyone else. And by the way, poverty is not just the Arab population. We also have poverty in the ultra-Orthodox population. And the challenge is not necessarily for, only for the Arabs. 75% the to 75% poverty rate for the Arab citizens of Israel. It's very close with the ultra-Orthodox population, the Jewish ultra-Orthodox population as well. And my role as mayor is to do three things. And that's what I've been doing. Job creation, so people can join the labor force. Focus on education and the number of Arab residents that choose and elect by option. The better Israeli education system has dramatically climbed, and about half of the population now wants to join our education. Uh, and we're working very hard to get people out of poverty. Can it's the same system. Me? Yeah. Same system between Jews and Arabs, and we're fighting poverty all over. And we're doing a good job. You've that. had ten years in charge of this city. Can you explain to me why the Arab population of this city lacks at least two and a half thousand classrooms, and only just over half of all Arab residents are actually connected to the water grid. 
Can you explain that? Yes, I can explain that very well. First of all, it's 4,000 uh, classrooms missing in Jerusalem, 2,000 for the Arab population, and 2,000 for the Jewish population. Well, it's actually 2,500 for the Arab population, and of course, let's, I, let's, let's remember that they are, what, 38% of your city population, not 50%. Agree. It's true. So it is, it is a scandalous figure, and you've been but in charge for 10 years. What I'm doing is I've, created, I've, I've taken a loan, and we're building, and we're catching up with that neglect. If anything, at my watch, we're dramatically improving that situation. And the city I received had a lot of neglect in terms of classrooms, not only for the Arab population. The reality is that you see that the neglect is, is, is all over the city. And if anything, I've now uh, uh, pushed the button and we are developing dramatically hundreds of classrooms every year. And we are catching up with neglect. And year after year, we're opening up new schools in East Jerusalem. And if anything, I'm proud of the fact that we admit the challenge and we're dealing with it. I took accountability and responsibility, and we're, we're developing the city for the benefit of all children. Here's a fascinating thing said by the president of your country, Reuven Rivlin, in uh, June, 1st of June, 2018. He said this, we have been saying for 50 years that Jerusalem is united, but we do not behave as if it is united. Well, I agree with some of what he said, which is there's a lot to do. That's why I left all my business career and focused on improving the city of Jerusalem. And I'm happy to tell you that in my term, in the 10 years I've been mayor, we've dramatically changed that momentum. It was a negative momentum. The gaps were growing and now they're shrinking. So if you look at the trends in the city, I'm, I'm, I'm very proud of the fact that I changed the trend. And now we're dealing with the reality and we're doing a good job relative to where we were, uh, and there's still a lot of work to do. Let me ask you a very simple question. H how good is your Arabic? I, I don't speak Arabic, but I know how to speak to the, my Arab population very well. I speak... you, you don't speak Arabic. So 330,000 of your residents are Arabs, but you, you've made no I effort in 10 them. years to learn Arabic. I speak to them on a daily basis. Do you think you can I put, serve yourself, them on a can daily you put basis? yourself in their shoes, see life from their point of view, really? Mm -hmm. You think you can? Of course. So how do. do you think, how would you feel if you were an Arab citizen of this, of this city and you looked at the, the building laws and you looked at the way in which construction works in this city and you see that the vast majority of building permits given are given to Jewish builders for Jewish residences. Let me quote you a Jewish, not an not a Arab-Palestinian, but a Jewish NGO who've studied this, Ir Amin. They say... 8% of building permits for housing units in Jerusalem have gone to Palestinian neighborhoods. 8%. That's nonsense. 40 in my decade. 40% of this city is Arab. In my, in, in my 10 years as mayor, that's total nonsense. In the past, if you couldn't prove that you own a piece of land, you wouldn't get approval. We have created uh, all kinds of structures to enable uh, uh, giving people permits. So we had lots of challenges to overcome for the benefit of enabling more building, and we've done that. And, uh, how, how, and that's total many, nonsense. How that's many houses different. have been demolished under your watch, Palestinian houses in Jerusalem? I think, um, if, if I remember correctly, there's about 200. Hundreds, yeah. 200 hundreds. a year, half in the west side, half in the east side. Um, I take extra care. When I look at um, how to help my Arab residents uh, to improve their quality of life, we want to make sure that there's enough places for building uh, green parks, and we want to make sure that there's enough places for schools um, and kindergartens, yeah. and we want to make sure they build properly. And by the way, it's well, the interest of the Arab population, and, and they come to me. The majority of the times they come to me and say, hey, this building is, is, is hurting our quality of life. Help us improve our quality More of than two and a half thousand Palestinians have been left homeless because of house demolitions. And at the very same time, they've seen that more than 2,500 Jewish settlers have moved into Palestinian neighborhoods in Jerusalem. Does that seem right to you? I don't know how you make that equation. People, when Jews buy apartment legally, they can buy and live Anywhere they want in the world. But oftentimes, there it's actually be. not done there's legally. No, there's no you, you connection know that if, if, if we go back to some of the famous cases in Silwan, one of the neighborhoods in the Arab east of the city, we see that uh, houses are built by Jews without permits. It's only after the event that the, 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 the buildings are legalized. You have been asked, even by the American government, to stop this happening, and you fail to do so. 
in Jerusalem, you have to build, everywhere in the world, by the way, you have to build legally. If you don't build legally, and I will help everyone to build legally, 1% of the buildings in Silwan have a permit. 1%. 99% of them do not have a permit. What I did, I changed the zoning code so that 97% would have a permit. You're taking two things that have nothing to do with each other. The well, first is, I, please build legally. I'm just trying to get second, to grips with the notion sentence. of justice. Steve, justice. Justice. One That's is what that I'm there's trying one to law about. in Jerusalem you have to build according to the law. On the other hand, Jews, Muslims, and Christians can buy anywhere they want in the world. Let's so if Jews buy apartment in, in the east side of the city, west side, or in Jordan, or in Syria, they're allowed to buy anywhere they want. Let's just talk about one other element of justice. Does it seem just to you that there are tens of thousands of citizens of Jerusalem in places like Shuafat refugee camp, which is inside the municipality of Jerusalem, which get virtually no services whatsoever from your municipality, because they happen to be on the other side of the wall, the security fence, call it what you will, that now runs through Jerusalem. They're on the other side. They do not get the services that other residents get. Is that just? Is that fair? They get all the services when they enter the fence, like any other Jerusalemite. But they're, they're, bear with me, bear with me. They are uh, Jerusalemites. They are inside let, let me, the municipality. Let me finish my sentence. But you've put them on the other side of a great big let wall. Let me finish my sentence. The challenge is security. And when, it's, when the, the people cleaning the streets are challenged and thrones, it gets uh, stoned, what eventually it's challenging to serve the residents. I wish we could take the fence off. It makes I wish we could, uh, Mayor, we could make, uh, enable the residents make, to get the service like anywhere else. Shuafat is one place Steve, which makes a mockery of your Steve, claim that, that Jerusalem is the eternal undivided capital of Israel. It makes a mockery of it. These people are Jerusalemites. They are given Let no me make services. my claim. They, they get, get the all the services. Of a wall. They get all the services. We've demonstrated and proved that if we didn't have the security challenge, we would serve them as much as we serve all the other residents. So how can we serve the other residents as, as much as we can? Because everywhere we can, we will. So it's exactly the opposite. Have you ever heard of a Jewish refugee? Uh, no, why? Because the Jews take care of all the refugees in the world. We take care of them. Why is it that only Palestinians, refugees are in Israel, in the land of Israel, are called refugees? Why does the Arab world take care of them? There's no accountability on the Palestinian there's side. Also, there's only blaming Israel for this. The, the, and we will do everything we can to help our Arab let me, let me quote you an Israeli attorney, an Israeli lawyer, Daniel uh, Siederman, who said this, the only place where Jerusalem is, quote, the undivided capital of Israel is in the fertile imagination of ideologues such as Netanyahu and Mayor Barkat. Nowhere else is there a mayor so utterly disconnected from and in denial about the realities of the flesh and blood city over which he purports to preside. Well, he's extreme lefty, and uh, I beg to defer. He, he's, and he's, I don't he's, a respected, worth... he's a respected lawyer and yeah. human rights campaigner. That's what well, he is. I understand, and it has nothing to do with what I do every day, the way I serve my Arab residents, what they treat me. You know, last month, we had the Ramadan. 1.2 million Muslims were, came to the uh, um, Temple Mount to pray, and they went back home quietly. It was one of the safest and quietest time we ever had. And they all said, thank you, Mayor, thank you, the police, for helping us and improving our quality of life. That, he does not report this, this that. Is, it's interesting you say that and you couch everything in terms of security because you made a very interesting speech to some Likud supporters a couple of years ago where you talked about your philosophy of coexistence and you said, I've requested closures and curfews across Jerusalem. We've put 30 closures in place. Mm -hmm. If you walk around the entrance and exit of the Palestinian areas today, you'll see concrete blocks. Right. This philosophy creates our level of coexistence. In what kind of coexistence is oh, that? Well, it was a time... Is that a philosophy of coexistence? Uh, let me share with you. Uh, yes, and I'll explain to you why. When we had inc incitements and riots all over the city for no reason... There were riots for no reason. The riots and, and the incitements were because Israel wants to change the status quo, which is total nonsense. We had a peak of violence. And I said in the peak of violence, when Jews were killed in the city of Jerusalem by violence, I said, hang on there. I will not let that happen. And in the peak of violence, we said to our Arab residents, you cannot. When there's a risk of life for Jews, unfortunately, I will protect the Jewish lives. 
And when the uh, Arab residents, the local Arab leadership, took responsibility over the riots, over the kids, and it stopped, we, we immediately put that back uh, into the safe. So for two and a half years, there's no, uh, there's no blocks. I think it's a very, very clear message to our Arab residents that we want to live together, we are living together, but don't start threatening or unfortunately kill Jewish Jews for no reason. Interesting. Do you think you might come to regret Donald Trump's decision, which you and Prime Minister Netanyahu have greeted with such joy, his decision to move the U.S. Embassy to Jerusalem? Do you think that may backfire upon Israel one day? It is one of the most important moves made by American presidents. That very simple recognition that anywhere you put a shovel on the ground in the city, you find Jewish roots, two or three thousand years. That Jerusalem was never claimed as a capital of any other people but the Jews for two, three thousand years. Okay? So the recognition that Jerusalem is the capital of the Jewish people is such a simple thing. And that recognition is so important, not just for us. We know it. We don't need that recognition. The Bible recognizes that. Uh, but the fact that the leader of the free world did it uh, is very, very simple move. I believe, if anything... Do you, do you, but do you want to tie Israel to Donald Trump so very closely, to Donald Trump's values and his agenda? Look, look at what had happened since. I mean, we've got a, a very, very few nations who've decided that they too will do the same thing and move their embassy to Jerusalem, but the massive majority of nations around the world are simply not following suit. Emmanuel Macron, the president of France... I thought France, you were going to say something else. Well, hang on, let me yeah. just finish. Macron said recently, our philosophy remains exactly the same. Recognition of two states, Jerusalem... Jerusalem will be the capital of two sides uh, with common frontiers rec uh, recognized according to international laws and rules. I thought you were going to say something else. What did you think I was going to say? That you were amazed how quiet the city is. That since that recognition, the city has, is flourishing and developing. And I, I believe the Arab residents accept the fact that it will stay forever a united city. I thought you were of course, saying, we've seen a lot of violence elsewhere. We've not seen in Jerusalem. a lot of violence yeah, on the Gaza border. It's not connected to the city, right? But it's not connected to the o fact. On the, the day of that the U.S. formally opened the, the embassy but site, how come Jerusalem? In, is... in in Jerusalem, we saw more than fifty Palestinians it's shot. It's not there. contested inside the city of Jerusalem, and the Arab residents understand that it's for the benefit of them as much as anybody else. And I thought you were also going to say that you probably agree that nowhere in the world. A split city that has, has ever functioned. I thought you were going to say that, wow, indeed, the city is now working as the common denominator for people that respect each other in, in the Middle East. It doesn't exist anywhere in the Middle East. But the point, the point is, Mr. Mayor, you can't change facts on the ground. There are still 330,000, possibly more, Arabs living in this city who don't get to vote in Israeli elections, who are, if it is looked at from the outside, not treated in the same way as the Jewish citizens of this city. You can't change that reality. So ever, however much you talk about it being one city, united, completely united, from the outside, it is still a fundamentally divided when city. When you look at the outside, when you enter the inside, you understand that uh, they have a right to vote for the municipality, like green card holders everywhere else, and they have an irrevocable right to become an Israeli citizen if they want to. It's a uh, legal, well, it's a, it's a legal a right. <laughs> Just a few and, thousand, and, and thousands just a few thousand have sought that right, and mo the majority of those who've sought that right have been rejected. So let's be clear That's about that. That's not true. It, well, it's it a, is true, actually. There's a, there's a if bit you of bureaucracy the not on, under my responsibility, and I will help them pursue their right. Before we end, because we're running out of time, I do want to also cast forward. You're, you're leaving the mayoralty after two terms. You've made it clear you now want a national political career. You're going to run for Knesset for the Likud party. Do you see this what you've done in Jerusalem as a springboard to national office. It's my honor to take my experience as a um, combat uh, soldier, uh, officer in the paratroopers, and then as an entrepreneur in the high-tech sector, and in 10 years serving my city as mayor. It's my honor to take those skills and serve my country. Benjamin Netanyahu, the prime minister, is facing two different sets of investigations involving allegations of bribes, of sweetheart deals with newspaper owners. It's extraordinarily complex. He may well end up being charged and indicted. His wife also faces charges. There are many people inside the Likud party who are now beginning to feel, it seems, that Netanyahu's time is coming to an end. Do you want to lead the Likud party? The Prime Minister Netanyahu is doing a phenomenal job leading the country. 
He's my friend. A lot of my success is due to his support and to the, to, to, to the backup I got as mayor of Jerusalem. I will stand to his side and help him manage the country in the next uh, uh, terms until he decides to leave. Have you seen the polls which suggest that Jerusalem Post poll, 59% of people said the criminal investigations of Prime Minister Netanyahu are damaging his ability to run the country and handle security crises. When asked whether Netanyahu is corrupt, 48% of the respondents said yes. The Prime Minister is doing a very good job as Prime Minister. And this is all noise. Don't listen to such noise level. Well, no, it's polls not, are not just noise, is it? I mean, there are police investigations continuing. That's fine. Police can investigate. Um, I have no problem with investigations by police. My prime minister is doing a good job, and I'm supporting him, and I'll continue supporting him when I uh, become a, a parliament member in the Likud. Do you believe that Israel can and will make deep compromises for peace, compromises that will have to include Jerusalem? The answer is... A bad deal is worse than no deal. So if positioned by a bad deal, Israel will say no. Any prime minister will say no. The people of Israel will say no. A good deal, like we did with Egypt and like we did with Jordan, with Israel demonstrated. Do you, believe, knows in a, how do you to... believe in a, a two-state solution? Uh, no. You don't? No, I don't think so. I do believe in giving our Arab residents in uh, Judah and Samaria uh, civil autonomy, I do believe we should work together in mutual economy, and I believe that uh, Israeli uh, defense should be um, uh, all over uh, Judah and Samaria. Unfortunately, we've seen times when the Arab residents flip on us, and they um, unfortunately sometimes... So your vision, uh, coming off 10 years running Jerusalem, your vision is of a permanent occupation, is it? Or are you going to annex no, the West no Bank? You believe I, in annexation, but giving uh, those people, the Palestinian people who live in the West Bank, what you call autonomy rights, but no right to vote in Israeli elections? It wouldn't elections. be the first place in the world that you have a special, unique arrangement. There are many, many places in the world that have special, unique arrangements, and this should be one to of quote, them. To enable to quote Israelis, Arab including uh, uh, former Prime Minister Olmert and Barak, that sounds like an apartheid well, solution. That's, that's, first of all, that's why they're not in power. I don't think they know how to present um, Israeli public opinion. Second point is that I do think that the Arab residents in uh, uh, Jenin and Shechem should have their autonomy and manage their civil life. We don't need to manage their civil life as much as they don't need to manage Jewish life. Um, I strongly recommend, I like think, Jerusalem, the extension in, in Jerusalem. South Africa under the apartheid system, those were called Bantu stands. Is that what you're suggesting the Palestinians will have to live in? No, Israel's the, the, exactly the opposite of any kind of apartheid. There's no separation in our buses. There's no separation in anything. They, we go to the same hospitals and everything is open. You know, people coming from South Africa, I'm married to an ex-South African. They laugh when people talk about apartheid in, 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 in the country of Israel. It's, it's total nonsense. The reality is that it's an open system, it's the only democracy, the real democracy in the Middle East, and the reality is that it's a challenged land, and in other places in the world where land is challenged by, by third parties and others, you have to look and create a special arrangement, and a special arrangement that enables the Arab residents to have their autonomy, that's fine. Actually, we propose to improve the mutual economy, and unfortunately, because of the past experience, not give them an army, and make sure the Israel Defense Force always has the ability to uh, ensure security. We don't know what's going to happen to Prime Minister Netanyahu, but are you now throwing your hat into the ring to be his successor? Would you like to no, lead the Likud no, party? No, uh, it's not on the table. Right now I'm going to help and stand on his side. Uh, I'm, just, I'm going to complete this November my role, 10-year, very intensive role in the city of Jerusalem, and I'd be happy to serve to his right, whatever we'll talk, we'll, we'll talk about it when, when due to, in due time. Right now, it's not on the table. Mayor Nir Bakat, we have to end there, but thank you very much for being on Hard Talk. Pleasure. Thank you, Steve. Thank you.